Thank you very much, Rita, and thank you for also bringing up Joanne and Janet. So neither of them were able to come. I think there's a bad cold going around Victoria that Janet has caught, and um, all we know of Joanne is that she's just, her health isn't good. Um, so yeah, so they're not here, and thank you for reminding us of them. I wanted to change Rita's uh, abstract noun to humble. Thank you, Rita. Robert Bringhurst is the author of more than 30 books. More than half of these are poetry. He is also known for his studies of Haida, Haida and Navajo oral literature and for his work in the field of typography. In fact, um, he's most recently been designing books for brick books to celebrate their 40th anniversary for class, brick classics that are quite gorgeous. Um, and the next one that, that's coming out is a classic by Jan Zwicky. His selected poems are published by Jonathan Cape. Two volumes of his essays selected and lectures, The Tree of Meaning and Everywhere Being is Dancing, are published by Counterpoint. Other books include A Story as Sharp as a Knife, The Classical Haida Myth Tellers and Their World, and The Elements of Typographic Style, which is now in its fourth edition and has been translated into 10 languages. Robert Bringhurst lives on Quadra Island. Please welcome him. Yvonne, thank you very much, and thank you all. It's a great treat to have such fine company. Um, advertising is a difficult business. Things are always changing. Um, so I'll make one small correction. The next one of those brick classics that's coming up is a Beryl and Dumas book, the wonderful book that launched her career as one of Canada's finest Métis writers. Um, and Jan's, book will, Jan's, Jan's book will be along in the series a little later in the year. Um, I'm going to tell you some Sam Hamill stories. Um, <laughs> because, uh, when I first met Sam, he was a 14-year-old juvenile delinquent in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> and, and then as now, he could walk through walls and spend all night laughing about it. <laughs> but um, I have to escape from my assigned abstract noun, so uh, I won't claim to know anything about anybody or anything. Uh, but I'll read you a poem called Saraha, which deals with or remembers the person that Sam knows very well and has something to say about water also. What is, is what isn't. What isn't is water. The mind is a deer. In the lakes of its eyes, the deer and the water must drink one another. There are no others, and there are no selves. What the water sees is, and is not what you think you see in the water. There is no something, no nothing, but neither. No is and no isn't, but neither. Now don't defile the thought by sitting there thinking. No difference exists between body and mind, language and mind, language and body. What is, is not. You must love and let loose of the world. I used to write poems, and like yours, they were made out of words which is why they said nothing. My friend, there is only one word that I know now, and I have somehow forgotten its name. <laughs> Thinking about language and writing poetry at the same 
same time. <laughs> Terrible thing to do, clearly. Very dangerous to your health. <laughs> I'll read you one of one of these. It's called language poem. They all they all have the same title. <laughs> <laughs> The heron has practiced his silence longer than time has been time. When he rises and speaks, there is no one in the cove who doesn't listen. There is no one in the cove who couldn't translate what he says, and no one in the cove who wouldn't realize the heron had been lost in that translation. Everything speaks for itself in this world, and everything rests in what is unspoken. Harry Woodpecker, too, mystified, miffed, or exasperated, or pleased, utters his one word and jumps, or hunkers down and squeezes hard, hanging on for dear life to what is, or swimming right through it as if it were there, and it is, and it is. How many more words would it take to make up a language? Does language actually have to have words? What it must have are meanings and some way of saying these and not those are the meanings that stand here uncovered or covered. The meanings the language must have are the meanings it lacks, located outside it, like sunlight and grass. So together with meaning, there has to be pointing at meaning. A language, in other words, has to have gestures, and speaker. One each, let us say, for a start. With a little bit more, one speaker, two gestures, one gesture, two speakers, along with the requisite bedrock and fauna and flora of meanings. It might make the first blunt lurch for a life of its own. It needs bedrock and air. That is, it needs meaning and room to maneuver. That and a finger that swings like a needle. That and an ear that can hear where it swings. The sounds of your speech are nothing but gestures that reach around corners and work in the dark. The sounds of our footsteps are nothing but gestures out hunting for meaning and finding the ground. There are languages spoken by millions of humans in which there are syllables, gestures, with dozens or hundreds of meanings. Imagine a language with only one word and 500 meanings. Imagine one finger and 500 moves. You are not so far now from the woodpecker's language, and not so far now as you were from the shuddering throat of the great the blue heron or the sandhill crane. If you tried, you might cling for a moment or two to those hollow-boned fingers of air in which five million years worth of watching and thinking are cut like a fossilized fish in one felted, eroded, unanalyzed word. The invisible dictionary that sits on a rickety, tilted shelf of air there in the great blue heron's kitchen, open to the weather, perpetually shredded and reprinted by the wind, has only one entry, a thousand pages long. What does it mean, this evergreen book full of one-fingered meaning? That words are like wind in the leaves, and leaves in the wind, scraps of reality. And that we harness them, nevertheless, as the fishermen way up the river harness their cormorants, 
horsemen their horses, gold players harness their stone. That gestures are gestures, not only because we employ them as gestures. That gestures, like other things, are what they are. They are not what they point at and not what we thought we would get them to say in the same way that horses are not what we thought we would get them to pull. And the journey will tell you, whenever it's ready or not, if it cannot get through to you, where you were headed. Meaning was here well before you were. What speaks from the heart, what speaks from its heart, is in that moment spoken. A form of the language, a part of the speech, swinging down and back up and back down on the dangling tongue in its mouth. Like a bell, sometimes moving towards singing and sometimes toward walking and sometimes toward freezing and holding its breath in the breathing space between meaning and meaning. It brings the snowplow, too, in winter, and the stone-eyed crews who butcher everything that grows beside the power line each summer. But the deer, the wolves, the newts and voles, the self-dissecting slugs, the red-legged frogs, the black bears, those who live between the weather and the ground, just cross the road. They don't go up or down it. When it withers their descendants or successors, our successors, will replace it with a trail, not perhaps much different from the trail it used to be. The road goes east between the bluffs, descends the hill, and then meanders past the harbor to the coast. You go by boat from there, then drive, then catch another boat to reach the asphalt ocean. Disconnection is what keeps this road from swallowing the ridge, the hills, the island, and the trail. The trail goes west into the forest, up and over and along the island's spine, braiding and unbraiding like a river forking north, south, back on itself, and west again. The trail is one but many, lean but never hungry, 
absolutely logical, yet ever-changing, fissuring and shifting like a sentence or a story where its root is wide and flat, but as insistent as a song where it is steep and narrow. Newborn, ancient, growing, dying, running, plodding, knowing everything and nothing, rediscovering its way with every step it gives, and giving all the steps it has, and never taking any. The trail loves to hide, said Heraclitus. The trail that can be traveled like a road is not a trail and cannot take you and have to go. This trail drops, climbs, weaves around the tree trunks and the convoluted bedrock, pillow basalt, limestone, granite, streaks of shattered seafloor captured in the submarine eruptions of an old volcano, water-cooled waves of molten stone that surfaced south of here and long ago as islands of the one and only continent surrounded by the one and only ocean. No ravens, grasses, roses, daisies, alders, willows, apples, salmon, humans, seals, killer whales, wolves, or deer were here or anywhere in those days. There were mosses, ferns, and lichens. Cycads, ginkgos, geckos, dragonflies, and caddisflies, and beetles, sharks, and rays, lungfish, limpets, sea anemones, and jellyfish, and snails, yet even these were not the ones you know. The world's surface, when these basalt pillows formed, was made entirely of places you have never been. Inhabited by creatures you have never seen and mostly never heard of, breathing air you would not care for. There was no ice anywhere, even at the pole. It never snowed. The valleys and the flatlands flooded every time it rained. There were no flowers and no fruit. There were no herds or flocks, no meadows, prairies, pastures, and no grain. There were no bird calls, songs, nor singing lessons either. No skill was ever taught. No perception ever caught and handed on. No memory cemented into gesture and no gesture into story, song, or dream. Time had barely started talking to itself in any disembodied language. Life itself, at some four billion years of age, had hardly started talking. Noses, eyes, and ears existed. Fruits of the neural tree, but the green blanket of the world which is thin now, was much thinner then. There was no forest floor or canopy or grassland, not on earth, nor in the mind's eye or the mind. No place, that is, where visions could compost and feed each other. There were no winged creatures singing, nesting, breeding in the trees behind the eyes, thought had got as far as sound, as far as sight, but not as far as thinking. The trail was not here then. It does not remember having no ideas, and it does not remember never being something to it. So the trail cannot take you to that world, though it is buried very shallowly. The trail can take you to the rocks, but it cannot conduct you back into the world where they were formed. The trail cannot, but the road can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.